Hello, and thank you for joining me again today. Um, if you weren't here before, my name is Arnie, and uh, in this session, we're going to be talking about serverless and its use cases in games. Um, yeah, so I'm Arnie Birkison. I've, I've been a developer advocate here at AWS for some time now, focusing on game tech. And all in all, I've been with AWS for coming up on four years now, uh, first as a solutions architect working with games uh, customers of, of AWS, and, and then later, later on as a developer advocate. Um, prior to AWS, I, I led an infrastructure team at a game studio called Plain Vanilla Games, uh, where I was responsible for an infrastructure for tens of millions of, of users playing the game QuizUp. Um, so um, today we're going to be talking about, uh, and, and in, the, in this session, we're going to be talking about serverless. And I'm going to start by covering the basics of serverless and just going to make sure that we're all on the same page and we have the same understanding of, of what that is. Um, then I'm going to look into some of the major use cases that we see for serverless in games including real-time analytics pipelines and, um, and, a, and a couple of other things. Uh, I'm then gonna show you a simple example of an AWS Lambda function um, triggered by S3 events and how to build something like that, utilizing serverless services, obviously, and uh, AWS CDK, the Cloud Development Kit. So with that, um, I wanna make sure that we have a, a, have a common understanding. So what is serverless? There has really been a, a paradigm shift uh, over the last decades in, in the level of abstraction that we have available in, in computing. And if we go back in time, you know, there were physical machines and, and still are um, that you would operate in your own data centers. And you'd have to estimate or essentially guess your capacity needs a few years in advance. The purchasing these uh, these machines were it's heavy investments and you have to live with your investments for a long time. So if you if you overestimate, you're going to have underutilized hardware and you're spending too much. And if you underestimate, well then you don't have enough capacity to run the systems. And deployment obviously also takes takes a while in this scenario. So over time, there's obviously been advancements separating the operating systems from the hardware and using virtualization. And you know, with that, you started to be able to scale and modify the environment much more quickly. And you know, obviously provisioning a virtual machine is much, much quicker than provisioning a, a full hardware server. And then we kind of from there get to containerization. So th this provides an even higher level of abstraction with a consistent runtime environment and developers can really start focusing more and more of their time just on the logic of their applications or their games instead of you know, compatibility with operating systems and configuration of various different hosts and so on. Uh, so there's a huge improvement in deployment speed as well. And if you think about you know, starting a container, that's much, much closer to starting an application than it is to, to starting a, um, a virtual machine as a comparison. And you kind of see where this is heading with the higher level of abstraction. AWS Lambda allows you to focus on the application code and logic only, and you can choose when and how that code is executed. And so serverless provides you know, continuous scaling, built-in fault tolerance, and, and pay for value in, in that you only pay for the time where the code runs. So you're paying for the value that you're getting out of it. And so if you compare the, the operational responsibility between those different levels of abstractions and, and within AWS, you see that you know, kind of going from EC2, ECS, Fargate, and, and to Lambda, the higher the abstraction level, the more things AWS manages for you and the less things you have to manage yourself. And therefore, uh, you know, the more things that are managed for you, the more you're able to focus on making a great game, which is um, the, the top priority. So um, if we look at the building blocks for serverless applications, serverless is much more than just AWS Lambda, although Lambda obviously plays a significant role. And here are some of the most common building blocks for, for build, building serverless applications. So you have AWS Lambda as the compute layer. And you know, this is the layer that executes the code and, and it's also available at the edge with Lambda at edge uh, and, and CloudFront. And then you also have the option of using AWS Fargate, which is serverless hosting for contain, uh, containerized applications. Um, 
And then if you think about the, the API management, you have various ways of, of triggering the code execution. You can have a REST API using API Gateway, or you could have a GraphQL endpoint using uh, AppSync. And you can orchestrate longer execution flows using staff functions, and you can create event-driven architectures uh, using EventBridge. And so, you know, there, there are serverless options for storing data. You have Amazon S3, obviously, and, and DynamoDB, as well as serverless versions of SQL databases like the Amazon Aurora serverless, and so on. So, so um, serverless isn't isn't just uh, a single service or um, or um, you know, it, it, is, it is a way of consuming uh, services, rather. And so we see all these different parts that make up a, a serverless applications. Um, and essentially, uh, serverless is the removal of undifferentiated heavy lifting, that is server operations and management and scaling of the infrastructure to support it. Because it, it scales for you, you pay for what you use. You don't have to manage the infrastructure, and it has high availability built in. And so now that we have kind of defined serverless, let's look at some uh, interesting use cases that are that are out there. So you can use serverless to build entire applications. So for anything between a, a simple static website to complex backends for mobile applications, analytics pipelines, powering chatbots, or or automating infrastructure management. Anything is really possible with, with serverless and using kind of different components and, and different services. Um, and we have a, a case study for one of our customers, Square Enix, about how they used uh, AWS Lambda with S3 and SQS to process images. Now, it's a slightly old use case, but, it, but I think it's a great and it's a simple example. So Square Enix is renowned for creating some of the most recognizable game franchises, including Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy and, and Tomb Raider. And they needed to accelerate image processing for screenshots that were taken in Dragon Quest X as the, the load time was very variable on the system. So at the time, the system would normally be handling two to 300 images per minute. But during specific times of the year, it was peaking at up to 6,000 images per minute. And the previous system that they have would queue up for, for several several hours when this happened. And so the serverless solution that they created is, is simple, but it's powerful. When a screenshot is, is taken in the game, the, the binary image data is first uploaded into Amazon S3, the simple storage service. And Amazon S3 then, uh, with an event, triggers an AWS Lambda function for image processing. Now, um, you know, when that's done, the, the queue that, that is on the picture is, is uh, now contains a, a binary image data output um, from the, the Lambda function. And so from the queue, it's imported into the on-premises servers and, and, and saved there. Now, uh, you know, the, the, to the total effect for, for Square Enix when they made this was both a reduction in processing time and the reduction in operational overhead and, and costs went down to one twentieth of what they were before and, and no queuing. And they tested this system up to um, 18,000 uh, images per minute, which was three times what the, the peak that they had seen was and performed well. Uh, so it's a very simple architecture and we'll get back to that later. But um, uh, yeah, let, let's go. Let's, let's check out another one here. So, so Quantic Dream, when, when they were deploying workstations on Amazon EC2 using uh, G4DN instances, they needed a mechanism for the developers and artists to be able to simply manage it and to be able to you know, find and connect and start and stop their, their cloud workstations. And so they created a custom serverless backend and a small client application that interacts with the, with the serverless backend. And they used uh, API Gateway and Lambda to create this. And so when the developer or the artist that is using the client um, when, when they uh, interact with the, the serverless backend, a Lambda function is executed and it finds the workstation instance that belongs to the, the developer, the artist. Uh, it, it checks if it's started or stopped, and if it's stopped, it'll, it'll start the instance. Then it'll uh, find the right IP address to connect to. And last but not least, it'll launch the nice DCV streaming desktop client to connect to the right IP address and the right port. Uh, so again, it's a very uh, simple use of serverless, but it's also really powerful. Now, the, the third example that I have is, is on game analytics pipelines. 
And whereas traditionally you needed to have a large amount of servers and storage for analytics, it's now possible to create entire game analytics pipelines using serverless services. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So as you're developing a game, it is important for you to have the right information at the right time to be able to answer questions about how your game is performing and what changes you would need to make to keep players engaged and keep them happy. And if you have that kind of information, that allows you to iterate on changes and overall provide a better experience for your players and, and make a better game. And we believe that this is especially important nowadays because games are transitioning more and more into these uh, live ops models and as a service models, uh, subscription models and so on, where companies continue to invest in games after launching them. And they really treat them like live online services, not just a, a box that you buy. And so the analytics flywheel for games goes, and as, as you can see on the picture, you know, the, the more data that you have, the better design you're able to make. And again, you know, the better design you make, the, the better experience your players will have, they will be more engaged, they will drag their friends along with them to play, uh, eventually le leading to you having even more data and, and kind of this, this will grow the overall engagement and, and usage of the game and, and thereby the revenue and the growth. Um, it's also important when you're, you know, when you're working with all of this data that you need to derive insights from that to, you know, you need to understand that data has a shelf life and um, as essentially, you know, to be able to make real time decisions, you need to have uh, a pipeline that will be as close to real time as possible. And, and you can say that data loses value very quickly over time. So Real-time data is the type of data that can you know, help you reduce the time it takes for you to fix issues or make important changes to your game that retain players and imp improve the experience even while the players are playing, while the older data is useful for reporting and aggregation purposes and measuring you know, activity of users, measuring retention and so on. So that's kind of more the, the reactive and the historical data. Um, uh, all right, and some of the, the challenges that we see within game analytics are that, that you know, our customers are generating more data than ever from their games, and they're looking for analytic solutions that can help them easily make sense of all of that data while still being scalable and you know, ultimately without infrastructure to manage. And prepackaged game analytic solutions, they often lack the flexibility that, you know, to, to let the customers ask their own questions, of their data with the tools and you know the the um, the systems that they want to use, both their their analysts and their data engineers, and these tools also frequently focus just on the player data and, and not really the entire picture, and therefore you know they can create data silos. And customers also want solutions that allow them to standardize their analytics on a common set of tools and allow them to to centralize their data sets and and you know have flexible access by by all of the users in the company that need it. Uh, and, and also in, in formats that allow them to, to use the tools and, and, uh, and the systems that they want, as I mentioned. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of customers that have built their analytics pipelines on top of AWS, and the use cases are also varied. Sony, for example, uses AWS analytics, including Kinesis and Lambda and DynamoDB for fraud prevention for the PlayStation Store. And Epic Games powers an entire organization-wide data platform on AWS. And it's backed with Kinesis, S3, and EMR, and they use the data to provide real-time events to, to service teams. And Singa, they leverage Kinesis data analytics to help them understand usage behavior in real time in uh, the game words uh, with friends, and that by daylight, they survive the test of time using uh, AWS. Um, so there's a, there's a number of different, different use cases and different reasons. So, so what I wanted to talk about is actually the, uh, the game analytics pipeline solution, because there are many options in how you can build analytics pipelines on top of AWS. Um, but this is a, a ready-made solution that you, that you can use, and it, address, you know, it aims to address these common challenges that we see. And it does so also using serverless technologies, including Lambda, Kinesis, S3, and more. And so, to, to give you an overview of that, the, the Game Analytics Pipeline solution is a cost-effective solution. It offers very scalable storage because it's built around S3. 
It also allows you to analyze your data with the flexibility of choosing either AWS tools or third-party tools, uh, depending on kind of what you prefer. Um, and it's very easy to, to deploy and to customize. And so let's dig a little bit into how that's achieved. So first of all, the, the, um, the streaming data ingestion. This uses Kinesis data streams and Kinesis data uh, pipelines for, for ingesting. And you know, collecting real-time streaming data and automatically loading it into S3 in an optimized format, in a parquet format. And Lambda there provides the, the data uh, pre-processing. Now for um, Kinesis data analytics is then used to generate custom real-time metrics with streaming SQL queries. And here Lambda publishes the metrics to CloudWatch. Now the solution, as I mentioned, it's backed by a data lake in S3. It includes pre-configured integrations with S3 intelligent tiering to automatically manage the life cycle of, of data that is ingested. Now, S3 provides the most cost-effective storage uh, of data on S3. And it also provides the most flexibility for customers to integrate the data with the tools that they want to use because both the, the tools that are available from AWS and most third-party tools uh, are able to interact with this, this um, setup in, in S3 and the, these formats which are open. Now, the solution also deploys AWS Glue to provide a data catalog for the data that is ingested into the solution. And therefore, it makes it easy for customers to integrate data from across applications and users. And last but not least, the solution includes a CloudFormation template and open source, um, or it, it's in an open source code repository. And so, you know, that as well as having a development and deployment guide that you can download means that you can easily extend the solution or you can experiment with it. You can use different components and, and kind of, um, yeah, extend and customize as you see fit. So let's have a look at what the, what the architecture for it looks like uh, in, in a complete picture. So data flows in on the left side and the data can be ingested directly into the Kinesis data stream or through a solutions API for integration flexibility. Now the difference there is that typically the, the data that uh, comes from authoritative servers and, and things that are within your span of control, they can usually flow directly into the, the Kinesis data streams. Uh, while uh, you know data that's coming from clients and kind of coming from the outside, you would typically want to have that authenticated. Uh, and you might also not want to um, integrate the SDKs into all of the different clients. And so the solution API provides a REST interface that you could use instead. Um, there's a, a, a AWS Lambda authorizer that provides API key authorization so that you have the flexibility to integrate with your existing authentication solution. Uh, or you can also use um, Cognito if, if you uh, don't have an authentication solution already. And the solution can take in data from multiple different games because the solution API en enables administrators to register new games and create new API keys for applications so that they can send data through the, the REST API. So you can have multiple different games utilizing the same system and the same solution. The, the streaming analytics part, as I mentioned briefly before, the, this is using Kinesis Data Analytics. And this allows you to you know, generate live KPIs and you can write standard, standard SQL queries that uh, query the stream directly. So you can do things that you, know, you can summarize um, the stream or you can aggregate things on the stream, find averages or, or things like that on the stream. And then you can output that um, as a separate stream. Now, uh, AWS Lambda enables post-processing and delivery of streaming analytics output data to CloudWatch as custom metrics. And then um, the solution provides streaming ingestion of data into uh, a data lake storage using Firehose. Uh, so that's the third type of Kinesis that we're using in there. And I'll, I'll get back to that as well. And they use Lambda uh, to, to validate there as well and, and transform and load the raw event data as uh, compressed parquet data. And this data is automatically registered in the data catalog in Glue so that you can immediately start querying the data within minutes. Now, if you follow the deployment guide for the, the solution, um, you, will, you will see that the solution comes with example queries and example dashboards and things like that that you can uh, immediately start looking at as well as a data generator that you can uh, use to create sample events that kind of uh, fit into the system 
uh, so you can immediately start seeing what what this would look like for your game and obviously on the far right side you'll see the the different types of uh, consumers of the data, the, the live ops team, service teams, data engineers, and, and data analysts, which, which are going to be interacting with different parts of the system. So depending on whether they want the, the live uh, KPIs and metrics, or if they are doing aggregations and um, reports and things like that. Now, one of the biggest benefits of serverless is that you pay for value. Right? And if you look at this architecture, even if it may look large and complex with lots of different services and different components, this architecture has a very, very low fixed costs. And that means that if you are in the development stage or if you're preparing for the launch of a game, you can deploy this solution to your account uh, very early and you can start trying it out. And there's no need to purchase large amounts of, of resources beforehand. When you have more game servers down the line and players that are sending traffic, the solution will automatically scale to match that. And so since I've mentioned Kinesis uh, so much, I'm, I'm gonna mention that here again. So Amazon Kinesis is a service that is specifically designed to collect and process and analyze real-time streaming data. And it's a fully managed uh, service and it's a very scalable service. And, and so we've seen this in, in, the, in the solutions uh, architecture uh, used in these three different forms, the Kinesis Data Streams, the Data Firehose, and the Kinesis Data Analytics. And so Kinesis Data Streams, they can ingest gigabytes of data per second from hundreds of thousands of, of sources at the same time. And Kinesis Data Firehose is a version of this that uh, is the easiest way for you to capture and transform and load data into data stores. So Data Firehose, for example, in this solution is responsible for taking all of the data that comes in and bringing it into the data lake in S3. And Kinesis Data Analytics allows you to analyze the data streams as they come in. And so that's where the, the part where you can write SQL queries and, uh, and query the stream in, in windowed segments. So you can look at, for example, what is the average amount of, um, of kills that have been happening in the game you know, per minute over the last five minutes. You can write queries like that that directly query the stream uh, and output that as a, as a number. Um, you can also use a Java version of, of Kinesis Data Analytics, uh, which is then based on Flink. And so because of these reasons, Kinesis tends to be the center point of any analytics pipelines uh, that are built uh, around AWS. So that's very often the case. And you know you've seen the big architecture for the for the whole solution but even you know using just these components in this uh, simplified version here with kinesis api gateway and lambda um, this is still a fully functional data ingestion pipeline that you could uh, that you could uh, use yourself um, so again there's, there's a number of studios that host their games and, and rely on aws game tech and Ultimately, whether you are a big multinational studio or if you're a small studio, you know, you're, you have access to the same platform and the same global infrastructure and the same services as, uh, as all of these, as, an, as Epic Games uses to run Fortnite and as Rovio uses to run, run Angry Birds and, and so on. Um, and so if we consider a little bit what backend services are typically provided for games and what typically is, uh, is required of games. And there's a number of them. It's going to be longer than this list. Um, we've looked into analytics specifically, but many of these other examples here, leaderboards, matchmaking, messaging, and so on, are also great fit uh, for, for serverless. And when you think about activities that players perform, such as finishing a level, um, there are certain things that, that need to happen immediately. There are other things that can happen a little bit later. For example, if you finish a level, marking that level as being done, being finished, maybe unlocking the possibility of continuing the game and kind of advancing to the next level, that action needs to happen immediately. And, and for actions that have that kind of immediate impact, you can use API Gateway or AppSync with a GraphQL endpoint to set up API endpoints that are served by Lambda functions and, and can take those kinds of requests and uh, react to them immediately. For other types of actions, let's say maybe bumping your score on a monthly leaderboard uh, or handing out an achievement because you've played a certain number of levels in a row, something like that. These kinds of things um, do not have to happen immediately. They might be perfectly fine to happen in an event-driven fashion, uh, 
uh, perhaps you know pushing message back to the player uh, when the system has been updated or or kind of pushing that back to the client so that it can it can uh, inform the user and when you see those kinds of scenarios that opens up the window to use queues and streams and 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 with that add a lot more resilience to the game so if there is for some reason something that slows down the game or if there's something that causes a lot more load or an, an influx of players having these queues and these areas which can take um, a little bit of a buffer can be very helpful now in terms of multiplayer real-time game servers um, then there is aws fargate fargate is a serverless compute engine for containers that works both with amazon elastic container service ecs and Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS. And Fargate makes it easy for you to focus really on, on just building the applications and building the containers. Fargate removes the need for you to provision and manage uh, servers and, and, and uh, hosts for the containers because you just specify and, and you pay for the resources that you use per application. So essentially you specify how much memory, how much CPU do you need to have for that particular container and, um, and that's what Fargate will run for you and that's what you pay for. Fargate also improves security uh, because it uses uh, application isolation by design. Now with Fargate, because of you uh, being able to you know, spin up these containers without thinking about hosts and servers, there is no uh, over provisioning and there's no paying for servers that are sitting idle. And as Amazon's CTO, Dr. Werner Vogels, uh, described it, you should be able to write your code and have it run without having to worry about configuring complex management tools. And that's the vision behind AWS Fargate. And obviously that, that rings well with the uh, AWS Lambda functions as well and other serverless services. Now, by using AWS Fargate, you don't have to worry about setting up the underlying hosts. You don't have to worry about maintenance, patching, and updating. You can simply just launch the containers with the resources that they need, and Fargate will take care of the rest. And so to get you started on, on that journey, uh, we have an example solution on GitHub that shows you how to scale a fleet of game servers on AWS Fargate and uh, ECS, the Elastic Container Service. And this example also includes a serverless backend that can help you route players to game sessions and a sample client and a sample server to try it out. Uh, so if you if you click on that link or follow that link, you'll be able to see that solution. For my last example, uh, let's go back to the Square Enix use case. Now, the architecture that they had for the image processing looks sort of like this. Users take screenshots and the screenshots are uploaded, uploaded to the servers uh, and then from those servers into Amazon S3. Now, S3 triggers a Lambda function to resize the images and then communicating the changes back to the servers using the uh, Amazon SQS queue. So if you wanted to build something like this, how would you do that with, with serverless services? So let's simplify this a little bit. Um, I, don't, I don't have a data center, so I would just upload my images straight into S3. Um, I also don't need to have the, the queuing system here. Nobody's really waiting to see my resized uh, pictures. And so this simplified architecture here, how hard is it to make something like this with, with serverless? And so let me, let me show you how to do that. So I start out by writing a JavaScript function that can resize images. Uh, so please note that this code doesn't have a lot of sanit sanitization or, or error handling, so don't, don't use it in production. Uh, but essentially, when this uh, function is executed, it expects event data in the parameters. And the event data should include information about an object in S3. So it should tell you which bucket and which, uh, what's the, um, the key of the, the object in S3, which is a picture. The, the code will then fetch the object um, and, and resize that to a maximum of 150 pixels on, on either side, and then reformat it at, uh, as a JPEG using the Sharp library. And last, it'll upload the, the object or the resized uh, reformatted object into the same bucket, but under a different prefix. So it expects um, the images to come in with the prefix um, originals, and then uh, the images that are going back will, will have a prefix resized. So what else do I need here? I have this, this function here, uh, and I'm also going to need an S3 bucket. 
and I'm going to need something to trigger the lambda function to, to do this, right? So there's going to be some plumbing involved. So I'll start out with uh, infrastructure as code. Now, there's a number of infrastructure as code tools available, and I highly recommend in general that you use those, uh, whether you are, you know, if you have a preference or if you're a fan of a, a certain one. The, the or original infrastructure as code tool for AWS was CloudFormation, but uh, now we also have SAM, the serverless application model, and there's uh, a, a few third-party tools as well that, that support AWS well. And now, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, infrastructure as code tools allow you to define the infrastructure in code or in some sort of a template, rather than creating all of the resources that you need by hand. Now, when you do that, this vastly improves all of your, your operations because you can repeat the deployments using the same code and you can deploy the same setup into multiple environments or multiple accounts or, or even multiple regions or, or locations. And so for this particular example, I chose the uh, AWS CDK, the Cloud Development Kit. So uh, AWS CDK allows me to define my infrastructure as code, uh, but unlike most of the other tools, it uh, uses a programming language and not a JSON or YAML language uh, like, um, like CloudFormation, for example. CDK supports uh, today Python, Java, uh, TypeScript, JavaScript, and, and C Sharp, and there are more bindings to come in the future. Um, I actually believe the, the roadmap of CDK is uh, is open source, and you're able to. Um, uh, oh, don't don't quote me on that. I'm not. I don't remember if it is. Um, anyway, when you use uh, CDK, the the interaction with AWS is actually done using CloudFormation, and so CloudFormation becomes sort of an intermediary language, and not something that you would maybe look at very much unless you were uh, debugging something that went wrong. And so with CDK, if we, if we ignore a little bit of the boilerplate that goes around it, uh, creating an S3 bucket is a single line of code. Um, you know, if we, if we count the import of the, of the S3 uh, support there, then it's two lines. Uh, but essentially you do, you know, const bucket is a new S3 bucket and, uh, and you give it a, a, an ID. And that's all it takes for, for CDK to be able to create a bucket for you. Now, the, the Lambda function, we can also deploy the Lambda function in a similar way, right? Uh, it requires a little bit more code, uh, but uh, with the Lambda function, you know, we specify where can you find it. So it, it's in a folder on my computer called Lambda. Uh, it's in a file called uh, imageprocessor.js, and the function to be called is, is handler. And then we specify the runtime. This is a node.js uh, uh, 10. And um, since I don't have any environment variables, I could actually just skip the environment part there. Um, there's a small caveat here as well. I did also need to package this function uh, using the serverless application model SAM because the library that I was using um, needed to be bundled in a container. So th this is a feature of CDK2, but for some reason I couldn't get that to work. So, so uh, that's what I did here. Um, now, how do I kind of make this plumbing happen then? So uh, I'm going to need a notification event from the S3 bucket uh, about new items that are coming into the bucket and being created. And then I need to allow that event to trigger a Lambda function, so the image processing function, to happen. Now, this turns out is, is very easy also in, in CDK. I create um, a variable here called event source, and it's an S3 event source uh, for the bucket. And I set a filter for which events I want to catch. So in this case, I only want to catch when objects are created. So I use the event type of uh, object created. Uh, but I could also uh, catch when objects are being deleted or updated or, or something else, right? So there, there's a few different events that can come out of this. But I'm only only interested in the ones where um, where new objects are being created, essentially new images coming into the the bucket. Um, I also added another filter here because I, I only want these events to be sent when uh, the key matches the, the prefix originals. So only if I'm uploading a picture into, into originals, uh, the, this event will be sent. Otherwise, um, if, because I'm uploading the resized pictures back into the same bucket, um, 
that you know if I wouldn't have that filter that could trigger uh, an interesting loop um, and then um, last but not least uh, I need to well I need to add the event source uh, this event source that I created into the, the function um, and before I forget I also need to uh, make sure that the the function is allowed to read and write from the s3 bucket and so if you created um, these kinds of things in CloudFormation before, you will realize that this um, the amount of lines here is, is very, very small. For example, being able in a single line to refer to the, the bucket is gonna grant read and write to the function. Uh, this is vastly easier than it would be in, in most other languages. Uh, and so it, it's, it's lovely to be doing this in a, in a, in a programming language. And so let's look at the, the whole picture for this. Uh, this, you know, this is the whole CDK template that I created with boilerplate and everything, the imports, um, you know, the definition of the classes and so on. And this template can be deployed with CDK. Uh, and what's gonna happen then is that the S3 bucket is going to get uh, created, the events and the notifications are gonna be set up, the Lambda function is gonna be uploaded, those, those things are gonna be connected with each other. And so the, the whole uh, infrastructure gets made. Now, additionally to the CDK deploy command, which does the deployment for this, you can also use a CDK synthesize or synth command, which will output all of the CloudFormation code that has been generated. So everything that is gonna be uh, sent to AWS as the CloudFormation stack, you can, you can view that. And so you can debug and have a look at it. And so in this example here, the code on the right uh, when that's synthesized to CloudFormation, that becomes uh, 327 lines of CloudFormation. So this is quite a bit more condensed. Now, with infrastructure's code tools in general, you would then keep this code that's on the right side in version control, along with uh, either your, your, the, the rest of the application or potentially in a specific infrastructure repository that kind of depends on, on um, taste. And but keeping this in source control will allow you to treat the infrastructure for the services the same way as you treat your applications. You are able to, to track changes that are made, you know, who changed what, when, and why, which are all, all pretty important. Uh, and if something is changed for the wor worse, if something doesn't work anymore, you're able to go back into the repository and see what it looked like, who changed it, why did they do it, and so on. Um, so so that, that really kind of adds to the uh, reliability of your, uh, of your operations and of your infrastructure. Now, last but not least, um, because of, of, of CDK being responsible for the deployment and synthesizing the CloudFormation template, there's a CDK diff command, which will show you what is the difference between the current template that you are working on or the, the, the state of the template as it is, compared to what is already de deployed. And, and so that means that you are able to make changes to the, to the template, and then you can do a CDK diff, and you can see whether the changes that you have made are really the ones that you intended to make, uh, make dep uh, depending on the output of the, the CDK diff. And, uh, and last but not least, obviously, there's a CDK destroy, which will clean up and delete the whole stack and all of the resources that, that come with it. Um, so obvious question here. Um, does this work? <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I uploaded my, my profile picture here in a, in a PNG format at 192 times 278 pixels. Um, and then, um, well, the, the, the paths are very long because the bucket names that are generated by CDK are quite long. Uh, but you can see that I'm, I'm uploading a file there into the originals um, prefix, and then I'm fetching it back from the resized uh, prefix uh, a couple of seconds later. And, um, and the second image is a JPEG now, and it's 150 pixels by 20, 217. And here's proof uh, that, <laughs> if you don't believe me. Um, cool. All right, so, so that, was, that was an example on how to use CDK and how to uh, get started if you want to try out serverless, uh, you, using one of the examples that I, that I really like from our customers. And, Essentially, you know, whether, you know, game tech is um, is here to help. Whether you're a team of, of one or one thousand, we think that the, the, there's only really one thing that that uh, that matters here, and it's making a games that players want to play. And so, uh, you know, being reliable, being fast, uh, having good analytics, all of those things are going to help, and, and that's where we can help as well. Now, 
I hope these examples have given you good insights into what you can do with serverless, um, but essentially the possibilities are endless. Uh, so how do you get started? What's the path for, forward here? If you are starting from scratch in terms of your familiarity with the cloud and with AWS in general, uh, we highly recommend that you begin with the getting started with game tech online tutorial. Now that course is specifically designed for business decision makers and technical roles that work in game development. And it's self-paced tutorial of about 90 minutes. The, the course provides an overall introduction to AWS game tech services. And you're gonna learn which workloads are supported by various AWS services. And you're gonna gain an understanding of the, the value in, in you know, play retention, increased revenue and so on that AWS brings to game developers. You're also gonna be able to describe the workloads that are supported by AWS game tech with managed and unmanaged services. And uh, you'll understand better how backend services are used. Now, when you've got the foundational knowledge kind of in, in check, then you can continue to the, the rest of the learning path, depending on what your role is and, and which scale, skills you want to level up on. And so we have both a compute path if you are more on the game development side, and we also have an analytics path if you are a data engineer or analyst. Uh, and obviously you can do both if, if you're interested. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for joining. Uh, I hope you learned something new in this session and that you're inspired to, to take the next step towards building better games. Um, check out the, the Game Tech website and the Game Tech blog to learn more. And also check out serverlessland.com where there's uh, a lot of information about serverless services from AWS written by AWS experts, both from AWS and from our community. Thank you so much. See you later.